What makes Easter so special? You wake up early with the kids to find plastic eggs, go to church, share a family meal, and end the day feeling just as empty as when you started it. You're meant for more, and there's one who knows. He was making a way for you. The miracles he performed, the life he lived, the death he endured. Could you ever believe it was all about you? Come celebrate the most important day in history. With nine locations to choose from, there's a sagebrush in your neighborhood. We have something exciting in store for the whole family. Come find out why Jesus did what he did. Join us for Easter at Sagebrush. We sure hope you'll come for Easter. It's going to be amazing and even better. We hope that you bring somebody with you to hear the awesome message about Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Well, we are on week two right now of our deliberate series, and I want to start with a question, okay? Have you ever said something to someone that was obviously meant to be a joke, but they didn't take it that way? That happened to my wife, Amy, back when we were still engaged. Now, I lived at the time in a two-bedroom place with a roommate who was named Sean, and Sean was interesting. This guy stayed in his room all day and night, lived off ramen noodles and Rice Krispie treats, and he would take his G.I. Joe figures and stage them in these lifelike battle scenes, and some of them were missing limbs, and he would paint red nail polish on them to look like blood. Like I said, he was interesting, and yes, I slept with the door locked at night, <laughs> right? Well, one particular day, Amy took me for an appointment for dental surgery. I had four teeth pulled at the same time. And uh, the doctor called her back to the recovery room to grab me and take me back to my place a little bit too early. I think it's because he knew that she was a registered nurse at the time. But the uh, medicine was still in my system with that anesthesia going. I wasn't fully awake yet. So it took everything for her to get me back out to her car and buckled in and back home. So when she got to my place, she decided she would go in and ask Sean if he would come out and help her get me and bring me back inside to sleep it off. And of course, he said, sure. So they got me, brought me in, laid me out on the sofa and let me sleep. And then Amy said these words to Sean. She said, listen, he's got a prescription for pain medicine. I need to run and get it, and I'll be back in about a half an hour. Can you keep an eye on him while I'm gone? Sean said, sure, what do you need me to do? She said, well, just watch him and make sure he keeps breathing. <laughs> now, this is the part where you need to understand that not everybody picks up on humor, okay? Amy was just being facetious, right? She was just joking, but Sean thought that it was up to him to keep an eye on me and make sure that I didn't die. <laughs> so she left, took her about a half an hour or so, got back with my prescription. She opened the door. There I was right on the sofa where she'd left me. Sitting next to me in a chair was Sean. He was leaned over my chest, watching every single breath I took to make sure that I kept breathing, and thank God I didn't wake up in that moment because I would still be in counseling today. <laughs> the best part of the whole story, though, was when he turned and saw Amy come in, came, uh, uh, come in. He turned to her, and Amy said he had this relief on his face, and he said, guess what? He made it. <laughs> Bless his heart. By the way, Bless his heart is safe to say about anybody. You can always say bless his heart, okay? Bless his interesting heart. My poor buddy Sean mistook a playful comment that my wife made for a life-threatening situation that stressed him out for a half an hour, all because he didn't understand what she meant. Apparently, when you're speaking to somebody, especially about important things, it's really necessary to make sure they understood what you mean, right? Right? And that's why I believe that Jesus was so intentional, so deliberate with the final things that he had to say before he went to the cross. Unlike other times when he did things in secret or spoke in parables, Jesus chose to provide deliberate clarity so the people at his time and people like us would be able to understand the things that he wanted us to know. Now, 
Um, last week, Todd talked about what happened on Sunday, right? Sunday was the day that Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. But I know you and I want to know, okay, what happened next? Well, we're going to pick up that story, and then we're going to also look at what happened on uh, Monday and Tuesday. And we can't look at everything because it's a lot. But what I want to do is I want to look at three things that Jesus did that are very interesting, and I want to explore why he did those things, okay? Now, without further ado, let's jump into number one. The first thing Jesus did is Jesus cursed a fig tree. Mark chapter 11, 12 through 14 says, As they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. All right, what's happening here? Well, Jesus and the disciples had been outside of Jerusalem in a place called Bethany. They were walking back into Jerusalem, and on the way, Jesus saw a fig tree up ahead. So he thought, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to walk up to this fig tree. It's in bloom. It's beautiful. I'm sure it has a lot of fruit. I'm going to grab a fig and snack on it on my way. But something uh, unpredictable happened, right? As he got up to this fig tree, it had the appearance of being ready for figs because it was in full bloom, but there was no fruit to be found. And so Jesus did something very peculiar, very deliberate. If you think about most of the miracles Jesus did, they're positive miracles, aren't they? A blind person could see. A sick person would be healthy. Um, even water would become wine. But Jesus didn't do that this time. He actually did a negative miracle. He cursed a fig tree. Now, some of you, that hurts you because you're tree huggers. You know who you are. And you're thinking, why would Jesus curse this poor, sweet fig tree? It didn't do anything. But let me explain something to you that gets lost on us as non-Jewish people, okay? Back in those days... Most of the Jews understood that the fig tree represented Israel. If you go through some of the, the prophets, there are references where God is, is talking about fig trees, but he's really referencing this figurative idea of Israel or blessing Israel. And everybody in those days understood that a fig tree had one job, right? It wasn't to look beautiful, although that's nice. It wasn't to offer shade. It wasn't to provide great lumber to build a place. No, a fig tree had one job. What do you think it was? Right, to produce figs, to, to bear fruit. So put this together with me, okay, and we'll, we'll start to see what Jesus' point was. The fig tree represented the people of God. And figs, people of God, right, are supposed to bear fruit. They're supposed to do great things because of their connection with God. So what is Jesus trying to say with this miracle? He's trying to talk to the people of his day and to us and say, listen, a lot of you, you have this outward appearance of, of being spiritual, being religious. You might go to church. You might uh, carry a Bible around. You'll sing the songs. You'll nod your head at the message. You might even have a fish on the back of your car, or better yet, a sagebrush sticker, by the way. You could do all these things externally, but it doesn't matter if you don't produce fruit, does it? Otherwise, you're just like this fig tree. From far away, it looked like this beautiful tree that was loaded with figs. Well, until you got closer to it, and you realized there wasn't even any fruit to be had. It was, it was false advertising, Right? Listen, all of us can fall into this trap. We can come into this place, we can go through the motions, we can go day after day after day, and, and we can be kind of religious to people around us and even deceive ourselves. Jesus was making the point that who we really are is evidenced by our fruit. See, the fruit proves the root. If we are rooted in God, if we have established a, a foundation of beliefs and relationship in God, then 
God is going to work through that relationship and we're going to be fruitful. Now, some of you might be thinking, what are we talking about with fruit? Well, we're talking about Galatians chapter 5. Paul the Apostle writes about how for Christians, because the Holy Spirit comes and he lives inside of us, it produces great things in our lives. Here's what he wrote, Galatians 5.22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Think about that list for a moment. Are you bearing that fruit? The the longer you're a Christian, are you becoming more loving, more patient, more kind, more faithful? How's your self-control? It's time for a good fruit inspection, isn't it? And, And I think the point that Jesus is making is that just as a fruit tree has one job, and that's to produce fruit, God's people are supposed to produce fruit from our faith and our relationship with him. Something's wrong if we don't. We're either playing religious games and we're not serious about our relationship with him, or we're a Christian who's just not being obedient. But we should be fruitful, right? Jesus did something, he cursed the tree, and then I want you to see what happened the next day. Mark eleven twenty 20 says... In the morning, again, this is the next day, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. It's kind of scary, isn't it? I think it's a warning from Jesus. Listen, we have a purpose. Our purpose is to be difference makers. It's it's to be fruitful. And, And God, in his infinite wisdom, decided that it was important for us to reflect his image to reflect the fruit of a relationship with him. The evidence, friends, the evidence of your root is in your fruit. So that's the first thing that Jesus wanted us to understand. Christians should be fruitful. And by the way, if you're not bearing the fruit that we're talking about in this passage, it's because of one of two reasons. Number one, you are not rooted in Jesus yet. You don't have a real relationship with him. You can go to church, you can have a Bible, you can do all these things. But if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, then the Holy Spirit doesn't live inside of you and you're not going to bear fruit. Or it could be option two. It could be that you are a Christian, but you're not doing as John 15 says. You're not abiding in the presence of God on a daily basis. You're not letting God have his way in your life. You're just kind of picking and choosing how serious you're going to take things and The Holy Spirit is not able to bear fruit through you like he wants to because you won't let him. It's a good warning. It's the first thing Jesus said. Let's look at the second thing that Jesus did. He cleansed the temple. Now, last week, Todd shared about how it was Sunday, right? Jesus was, he was coming into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. Uh, The people were laying down the palm branches in his path. They were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes In the name of the Lord. It was a fever pitch moment. Now, I'm not a fan of WWE, okay? So don't judge me. But I like UFC. And, And my favorite part of UFC isn't necessarily just the actual match between two opponents. It's the hype before, right? The, the stadium is full of people. They're ready for the game. The lights come up. The fighters come down the ramp. They're playing great music. There's smoke. There's fireworks. Everybody is excited, right? Because they're ready for the battle to take place. That's the kind of energy I believe Jesus had as he came into Jerusalem. It was intense. So what did he do next? Mark eleven eleven. So Jesus came to Jerusalem, and he went into the temple. Of course he did, right? Everybody was ready. Everybody thought, this is it. Jesus is going to, he's going to call out Rome. The war is on. Time to take back our land. Jesus didn't do anything they thought he was going to do in that moment. Notice what he did instead. Verse 11 says, after looking around carefully at everything, he left. 
because it was late in the afternoon. And then he returned to Bethany with the 12 disciples. Nothing like I think they thought he was going to do. I think they thought he was going to perform a miracle. He was going to start the riot, start the rebellion. But the passage says that he looked around carefully at everything. And by the way, the language of that passage is talking about someone who is studying, inspecting, or evaluating the situation. Jesus was just watching what was happening and studying it intently. Why was he doing that? Well, again, just like the fig tree, if we don't know the history of the Old Testament, we might not catch this. But there's a passage in the Old Testament book of Leviticus that talks about this very thing. It talks about how uh, when people lived in a home, if their home became polluted or defiled by something, they were supposed to call a priest, and the priest would come to their house, he would inspect it to see if it was safe to live in, if the house needed to be cleaned up some, or if the house was so toxic, so polluted, it had to be leveled down to the ground. And that happened at times. In fact, Leviticus chapter 14 says, if he which is speaking of the priest, finds that the mildew has spread, the walls are clearly contaminated with a serious mildew and the house is defiled. It must be torn down and all its stones, timbers, and plaster must be carried out of town to the place designated as ceremonially unclean. You remember back in 2017, Hurricane Harvey? This hurricane hit the uh, southern part of the country. Places like um, Louisiana and parts of Texas were flooded. Uh, Amy and I had some great friends that lived in Houston at the time. Their house got flooded. They had to be rescued uh, from their home in a boat. <laughs> when that water came in and flooded these homes, some of these houses, they were okay after the flood subsided. Other houses, they had to have all the sheetrock torn out all the insulation torn out, all the way down to the studs because it, it had become toxic with mold. And other houses had to be completely leveled to the ground. They were too far gone. What does this have to do with Jesus, you might wonder? Well, not only did Jesus come into Jerusalem as the Messiah who was coming to save his people, Jesus came as the great high priest to inspect the, the house of God. His house. The Bible says that he came and he inspected and he watched to see if things were the way they should be or if sin had gotten so bad in God's house that he had to step in and fix things. Let me share with you just a few of the things that Jesus saw when he came. He saw sellers who were taking advantage of travelers. See, people would come from long distances to come into Jerusalem during the Passover to make their sacrifice for their family. But a lot of them, when they traveled, it was too hard for them to travel with their family members and an animal to bring for the sacrifice. So what they would do is they would wait until they got into Jerusalem and they would buy one of the animals there to use as a sacrifice. My wife from time to time wants to go to Disneyland or Disney World. I never go to Disney World and then wait till I'm inside to buy food. <laughs> a $7 bottle of water and, you know, $10 for French fries. No, I stop at Walmart and I buy tons of stuff. I stuff it in a backpack and we take it in with us, right? We don't wait till we get there. It was kind of that same idea. People would wait until they got into Jerusalem and then they would start to buy the sacrifices there. But the problem is instead of giving them a break, these sellers of animals would take advantage of their brother and sister Jews, charging them way too much for the animals. Well, there was a second thing they did. They also manipulated the money. See, when you came from another land, if you were a Jew living in some other country at the time, you had a different currency, right? So you'd come to Jerusalem, you would need to pay a temple tax, you would need to buy animals if you didn't have one for sacrifice, but they didn't accept your money. So you had to go see a money changer, and the money changer would exchange your currency for the currency that was accepted at the temple. Wouldn't you know, many times, they would give an unfair exchange rate that favored the money changer. 
People who did come, who did bring their own sacrifices. There's a third thing that happened. Many times the, the priests would tell them their sacrifice wasn't good enough. Now, to be honest, God did say when you come and bring a sacrifice to cover your sin, it needs to be without defect, free from blemish, right? It needed to be a good sacrifice. But the priests would take it a step further. They would find excuses why this sacrifice wasn't good enough. And they'd say, oh, no, sorry, um, this isn't a good enough lamb to sacrifice. But here's the good news. Right over here, I have a lamb that you can buy from me at a huge cost. Friends, this, is, this was an, a multi-million dollar scam. It was happening at the most holy place on earth at the time. Jesus saw it. So the next day, Luke 19, 45 says, when Jesus entered the temple courts, this is the next day, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Jesus came, he saw, and he cleaned house. He purified the place as the great high priest. And it wasn't yet time to level it to the ground. It wasn't that bad yet, but it would be soon. So what is the story that Jesus is trying to tell us? That we have to dress up to come to church? No. We have an easy dress code here. Just be at least PG, okay? Does it mean we can't have fun? We can't laugh at jokes? We can't drink coffee? No. doesn't mean any of that. It does mean that when we show up to church... This should be a a special place to us. This should be a holy experience for us. That sometimes, maybe if we're honest, we're a little too casual when we come in. And our heart is not really prepared. In fact, Jesus said this about worship. He said, but the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. What does he mean by that? Worshiping God in spirit means that we worship from the heart. That we we come into this place with a heart that's ready, a mind that's ready to give God something of value. We used to sing this song back when I was younger, and you might remember it, The Heart of Worship. I bring you more than a song. A song in itself is not what you required. God wants our heart. God wants, he wants us to come before him and and just bear our heart to him and be honest with him and, and love him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I think a lot of that even comes down to how do you prepare when you come to this place? Are you prayerful on the way to come to church? Do you come in here ready to go? Well, that's worshiping in spirit. And I'll be honest with you, I'll make a confession to you right now that I have come in this place before and I've mouthed the words to the song from my mouth, not from my heart. I've listened to the message and nodded, yawned, looked at my watch, thinking of other things, and I've failed to give God my attention or my affection. God wants my heart. He wants your heart. But he also wants you to worship him in truth. What does that mean? That means that we stand on God's word as the ultimate standard for what we believe and what we do. We worship him in truth. We don't come into this place and try to create God into our image. We don't pick and choose the things that God says that we like. Oh, I don't like that. I don't like that that's in the Bible, so I'm not going to do those things. But I'll do those things. No. No. The truth means that God's word is truth, and whether we always like it or not, we're going to submit to it. How are you doing worshiping him in spirit and in truth? Well, Jesus cursed the fig tree. He cleansed the temple. He did a third thing. He called out spiritual apathy. Anybody here ever been to the Lincoln Memorial? I had a chance to go back during COVID. Uh, As you know, New Mexico was locked down pretty good. So I had a little free time. I'd always wanted to go to D.C. So I flew out and spent a few days tootling around the D.C. area. Got to see amazing things that I'd always wanted to see. 
But I, I think the place I loved the most was the Lincoln Memorial. It was just awe-inspiring to me. And I think if we could have gone back and been at the temple with Jesus and his disciples, it would have been a lot like that. I think it would have been awe-inspiring. It was the holiest place on earth. It was magnificent. It was, it was remodeled by King Herod. And the disciples and Jesus on Tuesday were walking past it. And once again, the disciples were in awe. Here's what Luke writes. Some of his disciples, Jesus's, began talking about the majestic stonework of the temple and the memorial decorations on the walls. It's interesting that even though the disciples had certainly seen the temple many times, been to the temple many times, they were just as blown away by the temple as they'd ever been before, marveling at how awesome it is. Then once again, Jesus did something that burst their bubble. He said, hey, just so you know, the time is coming when all these things, speaking of the temple, will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. That sent shockwaves across the disciples. I mean, imagine if somebody told you, hey, in the, in the coming years, Statue of Liberty is going to be wiped out. White House wiped out. Remember how we all felt when the Twin Towers fell? It was just hard to believe that could possibly happen, but it did. It upset the disciples so much that they said, Master, tell us when are these things going to be happening? So Jesus explained what was going to be happening when he returns. It's called the Olivet Discourse. It's found in Luke chapter 21, and Jesus kind of closes out his Tuesday going through the signs of the times before his return. And notice some of the things that he mentions. Verse 8, many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. There would be this rise of false prophets, false religions. Check, right? Verse 10, nations will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'd be global wars. Check. Verse 11, there will be great earthquakes. There will be famines and plagues in many lands. Check. Jesus let them know, all these things are going to be happening, and then I will return. And he summed up everything that he told them on Tuesday in verses 34 through 36. Notice what he said. He said, watch out, friends. Don't let your hearts be dulled by carousing and drunkenness and by the worries of this life. Keep alert at all times. Jesus wrapped up his Tuesday teaching and he shared about his return, and I believe he did it for one reason, to try to wake up his disciples. Here's what's, this is what gets me. This is what makes me so sad when I read this story. What was the thing that the disciples were so focused on as they were walking with Jesus? Was it Jesus? No. It was the temple, right? They were walking by the temple, and oh man, look at that, that temple, that's so awesome. They had the Son of God, the one the temple was made for, walking with them, talking with them, right there in the flesh. It was probably the last moment they were going to have together as disciples, walking side by side with Jesus. But instead of understanding how important that moment was for them, they were focused on the temple. The disciples weren't much different than we are, were they? I wonder how many of us focus so much on things that aren't going to be around a whole lot longer. Listen, friends, time is running out. Jesus is coming back. We are called to redeem our time. We are called not to get distracted. We are called to keep the main thing the main thing and make the most of every opportunity before time runs out. Because Jesus is going to come back and He's either going to come back soon for us or we're going to go to him when we die, if we're Christians. But we will see him. And we can't allow these distractions to keep us from the most important thing. And by the way, just so you know, I get it. 
I, uh, I have two teenage boys, so I'm a dad. I'm a husband. I understand there are bills to pay. There are homes to take care of. There are promotions to seek so we can handle the economy. There are things to do. E- even good things can distract us. But I believe if Jesus was here today, he'd say, friends, listen, in the middle of all the worries and the stress and and the things that take your eyes off me, don't forget me. And don't forget what's most important, knowing Christ and making Christ known. Friends, we're living on borrowed time. And we got to live every day like it's our last. I have a great reminder of this from time to time when I go to the cemetery June 30th, 2001, my sister Lori took her last breath on this earth. She's 31 years old, didn't have insurance. So not only were we grieving the loss, and that she's my only sibling, so that was tough. But we didn't have a whole lot of money, so we had to scrounge as much money as we could to find a place to bury her and to pay for her funeral. And over the next coming weeks, as I came to grips with the fact that she was gone, I would go to the cemetery, and I, was, I would always leave there upset. And I told my mom, I said, you know, I, I think what makes me upset when I'm here is that there's this big, giant cemetery here where she's buried, and she is the only one in the family here. She's all alone. Now, I know she's not really there, right? I know that her body's there. I know that her soul is with God in heaven. She was a born-again believer. I know that. There was just (laughs) something about going into that cemetery, and she was there all by herself. And so one morning I woke up, and I called the offices of the cemetery, and I said, uh, hey, I wondered if you guys have financing. They said, yes, we do. And I said, well, I'd like to finance a spot right next to where my sister's buried. Don't think I'm going to need it right away. But I, I, I would love to finance that so that at least I know at some point, someday, when I pass, my sister's not buried there all alone by herself. Just, it just felt like the brotherly thing to do, you know? Now, what I, what I didn't see coming was that when I paid off this space, that they would go ahead and take a headstone and put my name on it. (laughs) I'm glad you think this is funny. (laughs) Pay it off, and then the next time I go, I walk up and there I am, I'm dead. And I mean, I'm three-fourths there. My name's there and my date of birth. They're just waiting for a, the moment I keel over and they're good to go. And honestly, every time I'm there, I, I, I feel something different. Sometimes I feel creeped out. I mean, it's not every day that you look at the place you're going to be buried, right? Sometimes I feel sad. But almost every time I go, you know what I walk away with? perspective because I've looked at the place where this body is going to be buried someday see I won't be here my body will be there I'll be with God in heaven and so will you as a Christian I don't know how much time I have I don't know how much time you have but it's maybe not as much time as we think it is is it I think if Jesus could say anything to his disciples and to us today, it would be what he said over Monday and Tuesday. It would be, friend, don't play spiritual games. Get serious about me. Get rooted in me and bear fruit. I think he would say, come to this place ready to bring your offering in spirit and in truth. Ready to love me with all your heart and do the things that I ask you to do. And then I think Jesus would say, listen, friend, I want you to live every day like it could be your last because one day, one day it will be. Let's pray. Father, I uh, 
I confess I have lived a tremendous amount of my life for myself. Lord, you've wanted to bear fruit in me, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and I have resisted that. I confess that I've come into this place and I've been more interested in my kingdom than yours. And I live day by day easily distracted by things that aren't going to last. Just like that temple that was eventually destroyed. Thank you, God, that you use this week to give deliberate clarity to remind us of what is true, what is going to happen, and the importance of being prepared for it. Thank you for speaking to us. I pray we would use this moment to speak to you. In Jesus' name, amen.